the surgical exposure and insertion of the cervical screws has already been done. To the right is the occiput. I am a left-handed surgeon standing on the right side of the patient. Here you can clearly see the external occipital protuberance. That is the midline keel or the crest which will be the thickest part below the EOP. The superior nuchal line runs horizontal on both sides of the EOP. Ideally, the screws should be in an area that corresponds to this inverted triangle shown here whose base is just below the EOP. This midline keel plate does not allow the screws in an inverted triangle configuration, but there are ones available like this that can. We cannot place this plate in reverse as by doing that, the side connectors will be prominent underneath the scalp. Make sure that the size of the plate is appropriate such that the rod will connect easily to the cervical screws. Then mark the site of the topmost screw just underneath the EOP in the midline. Using a 3mm burr, make an entry in the outer table of the skull. Then use a drill bit through a drill stop. The drill stop does not allow the drill bit to go beyond the measured distance. For the first pass, we have set the drill stop at 6 mm. After every pass, the hole is checked with a ball tip feeler. If the inner table is intact, the drill stop is increased by 2 mm. Generally, in the midline, we have to increase this couple of times to approximately 10 to 12 mm to break into the inner table. We recommend doing this in a stepwise manner to prevent inadvertent injury to the dura or other vital structures. If a CSF leak does occur, this can easily be stopped by bone wax or by placing a screw. If by mistake you are at the wrong location and puncture the dural sinus, similar strategy can be employed. Once inner table is drilled and a soft feel is noted by the feeler, the hole is tapped through its entire length. It is imperative that the inner table is tapped as well because if this is not done, the screw tip will abut the inner table and strip away all the tap threads. This will loosen the screw's purchase considerably. So take the utmost care to ensure that the hole is completely tapped. Sometimes a part of the EOP needs to be drilled away to flatten the surface so that the plate can sit flush with the bone. A curvature can also be given to the plate so that it corresponds to the curvature of the occiput. Then the keel plate with the side connectors is fixed to the skull with a 2 mm occipital screw. The side connectors need some bone wax to stay with the plate otherwise they will fall off easily while doing this. Tighten the screw such that the plate sits in the correct orientation. Similar steps are carried out for the other screw holes. As you move cordially from the EOP, the thickness of the midline keel will gradually reduce. The screws of the midline on either side have the thinnest skull thickness in this configuration. Approximately the midline screws are somewhere between 10 and 12 mm and on the sides they are about 8 or 6 mm. If we have used a 12 mm screw at the top, this one is either going to be a 10 or a 12. Again, ensure that the screw holes are tapped completely to the inner table. If the screw does not grab the bone or does not advance, do not push it in with force. This never works and the screw threads that you have tapped will strip away. Instead, gently remove the screw and tap the hole again. Typically, in the midline, the skull is so thick that you will feel the screw grabbing the outer table and the inner table separately. When the screws are tightened, they should not keep rotating in place, what in orthopedic lingo we call a GFR screw. They have to grab the inner table and stop rotating with a torque like this. For the two side screws, I like to converge the trajectory of the screw like this towards the midline crest. The rest of the steps are the same. The screw here are smaller and you might just drill one cortex and reach a soft end point. 
we have used the 8 millimeter screws in this case. Finally, tighten all the screws so that the plate sits flush on the bone surface. Next, to contour the rods, I like to use a malleable aluminum rod. A significant angular bend is necessary at the OC junction. These rods are soft enough that they can be pushed into the screw to get a template for bending the rods. They can be sized accurately as well like this. The final rod is contoured with inside to benders and it needs to be shaped exactly like the aluminum rod template. This avoids trial and error as repeatedly bending and unbending the main rod will weaken its strength and notch it considerably. Now that the rods are ready, I like to decorticate the C1-C2 joints with a curet. This is the last step before the rods are locked in as this area can bleed considerably when disturbed like this. The joints are crucial area where the fusion takes place. Hence this area needs meticulous attention. Autograph bone from the ILEC crest is packed into the joint. If reduction of basilar invagination is required, which is not the case here, then the joint can be distracted using Goel's cages. Finally, the rods are locked in place. In this patient, the reduction was achieved with position and traction, hence much manipulation over the rods was not necessary. If the rods are under contoured, then by cantilevering the rod to the occiput, one can push the odontoid forward. In addition, the alignment can be changed by compression and distraction over the rods. While tightening the rods, either use a rod holder to provide counter talk or an anti talk device. This prevents stressing of the screws. The final step is the decortication of posterior bone surface and placing onlay bone graft over it. Thank you very much for watching.